James Hauk Sr. Uh, he is from Timonium, Maryland. It's twice in a row I've gotten it. Uh, two out of the four ain't bad. <laughs> um, the reason that this is such a monumental occasion is uh, Jim is 90 years old, uh, has not had a drink in 60 years. And did it the old-fashioned way. <laughs> yes. The old-fashioned way in the Oxford group. So he is coming to us this evening as a distinguished guest of Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, I know that I have um, created a lot of controversy myself traveling around the country as an archivist, and uh, one of the controversies that uh, is still raging everywhere I go is uh, whether or not we can even consider this to be an AA meeting since uh, we have a non-AA speaker. I want to assure you that our history goes back uh, all the way to 1935 with non-AA members speaking uh, at m meetings. Um, and it's also in the first group handbook uh, as one of the three meeting formats, and it was called Distinguished Guests of Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, in the uh, conventions at uh, 1955 and 1960, especially 1960, uh, Bill Wilson had uh, Sister Ignatia on the podium, who was not an alcoholic, uh, uh, Sam Shoemaker, who was not an alcoholic, and on and on. Uh, and his wife, Lois, who was not an alcoholic. And others, yeah, I'm sure there were. Um, so this is uh, an AA meeting, and we are uh, having this format as a distinguished guest of AA as our speaker. Uh, Jim has also come with a wealth of information uh, he has brought uh, that we have included in the packets for the weekend, this How to Listen to God, this four-page outline, uh, which uh, is one of the most uh, concise uh, uh, pieces of work that I've ever seen on how to make the conscious contact with God and how to, uh, uh, how to act on the guidance that, uh, that you receive from that contact. Also, he's uh, supplied me and I've made copies of an early uh, Oxford Group pamphlet. This was pamphlet, could be the first Oxford Group pamphlet in the early 1930s, How Do I Begin?, and it also goes into uh, guidance and how to take action based upon the guidance. Uh, earlier this evening, uh, uh, James made a contribution to the Wilson House Library of 25 to 30 of the rarest Oxford Group books that I've ever seen. In fact, uh, eight or ten of those books I've never seen before. A couple I've heard of and have never physically laid eyes on them. And Jim has graciously uh, donated them uh, to the Wilson House Archives. Yes. As I said, this is a special occasion indeed, and I uh, do want to introduce uh, James Hout. How we do this now? That's it. Is that close? Well, thanks, Wally. Uh, I guess two weeks ago or so, I, I didn't think I'd be here tonight, but uh, I had a uh, Chris... Uh, is instrumental in this, and uh, she told Wally uh, about my connection with the early Oxford group. And I get a call in from Tucson, and uh, many calls, in fact, <laughs> back and forth and this sort of thing. But <clears throat> uh, tonight I'm reminded of, a, a, I used to work for a company, and uh, we were, it was back in the days we were putting in retirement plans. And uh, uh, in order for these plans to be effective, uh, every employee had to sign for them. And there was one old fellow by the name of Joe who said that he didn't understand the plan and he'd never signed anything he didn't understand, so he wouldn't sign the plan. Well, his fellow employees worked on Joe and, and the foreman and the department head, even the vice president came down uh, to uh, work on Joe. Uh, but Joe said no, he wouldn't sign because he he, he didn't understand. Anything. So finally, the big boss said, "Well, send Joe. I want to talk to him." So Joe went up and he said, "Joe, they tell me that you won't sign the plan." He said, "That's right. Never sign anything. I don't understand." The boss said, "Well, Joe, let me explain it to you this way: you either sign for the plan or you're fired." So Joe took the plan, signed it, and handed it back. So the boss said, "Now, Joe, why didn't you do that before?" 
He said, N -n -n no one exp ever exp explained it exactly like that to me. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know. Tonight I feel something like a mosquito in a nudist colony, not, uh, not knowing exactly where to begin. <laughs> uh, and, uh, uh, but... Uh, we're going to just do more over the weekend, so uh, uh, while well, I thought tonight we might just uh, deal with uh, with personalities involved in some of the early days of the Oxford group. Now, uh, it's, sometimes it's difficult to project ourselves back into the early day, but let's go back to a time when there was no AA movement. Uh, there was no Al-Anon. There was nothing, nothing like this at all. The thing we had then was the Oxford Group. That's all there was, the Oxford Group. And that's what Bill Wilson uh, came in contact with. It was the only thing up to that time that had ever changed Bill's life. He had a, a spiritual experience in his life, and... and, uh, uh, and it, out of that came the uh, genesis of the uh, of the A movement. So I, I met Bill Wilson in 1935. Uh, I had met the Oxford Group in 1934, and uh, Bill Wilson was a, a stockbroker on the New York Stock Exchange, and I lived in Frederick, Maryland, at that time. And Bill had friends over in Virginia, just across the Potomac River from us. And he used to come there for weekends to relax. And it was horse country, and he'd come down there with his friends and relax for the weekend. He heard we were having Oxford group meetings in the old Francis Scott Key Hotel in Frederick. So he would, he would come over Saturday night for those meetings. And the thing I remember most about Bill, and, and maybe, maybe, and maybe uh, the most outstanding, well, it's the any question it was, he was absolutely obsessed with the idea of giving to every junk that he, he met the answer he had found in the Oxford group. And the, so the first thing he would always ask when he came in, are we going to have any drunks here tonight? And I said, well, Bill, I don't know them. <laughs> I said, oh, there are some people that I guess that drink. I don't know if we're going to have it. Well, he said, if you do, I want to talk to them. I said, okay. So he would. Uh, but you, you have to remember, too, at that time, uh, we were just coming out of a, of a uh, prohibition days. <laughs> you, you all don't know what was involved in that. But in 1918, while well, the men were away at the First World War, the women all got together and went to the and went to the polls and they voted liquor out of the country. They voted prohibition in, and that lasted from then until 1933. <laughs> so there was no bars, uh, there was no taverns you could go to, no public drinking places at all. It was illegal. Uh, it was just like it was just like drugs. Maybe today is that uh, if you. If you wanted to drink, you you uh, you had the opportunity to buy some rot gut stuff that was maybe made in the morning, and you drank in the afternoon or something. And uh, there was a lot of bathtub gin. Uh, used to make. Uh, I used to go to the University of Maryland on the weekends, and we used to make. A, I've seen a, almost a half a bathtub full of gin. Uh, bathtub. They used to take uh, alcohol. And, and put uh, juniper juice with it and a lot of orange juice. And that was it. Uh, that's only, we didn't go blind, but that's what we, that's what we drank in those days. Uh, if, if you wanted to have a party, the parties were always in private homes. You either went into someone's uh, cellar or kitchen, pulled the blinds down, and that's where you, you had your party. Lots of homebrew made in those days. I became a master at making homebrew. Uh, I remember uh, uh, if you put uh, you put too much yeast in the brew, the, it would blow the tops <laughs> off of the bottles. 
And I remember it sounded like we were being bombarded one night when the, these tops came off and hit the bedroom floor. <laughs> and uh, so then, of course, you lost all the content of the thing. But th those, were, those were the conditions that, that we were drinking in in those days. So when I met Bill, we were just coming out of that. And uh, uh, so... Uh, uh, so then Bill kept uh, uh, Bill kept coming down on weekends, uh, and uh, he didn't come regularly. He come at different times, and so I got to know know him, I think, r real well. And uh, so then uh, uh, Bill, uh, of course, was in contact with Sam Schumacher in New York, and Sam was uh, Bill's mentor, and he helped Bill a lot to find his way spiritually in the early days. And, and, and Sam had, uh, he ran the, uh, it was a, the Episcopal Church in New York. It was called Gramercy Park Episcopal Church. And uh, he had a large Oxford group me meeting there. I think they had three or four or five meetings a week, uh, different groups there in the parish hall. And Bill was a part of this. And uh, uh, Bill got to the point where uh, he wanted to just uh, uh, have meetings uh, in the parish hall just for alcoholics. And of course, he they said no, you couldn't do that. But Bill went ahead and had a couple anyhow. Uh, and, uh, this is this is Bill. Uh, so they uh, they pulled rank on Bill and, and said that he couldn't have any more meetings there. And then he took the meetings out uh, after that. So it was in this this framework. I guess it was 1938. Uh, Bill went to Frank Bookman. And Frank Bookman was uh, the initiator and the guiding light in the Oxford group. And of course, Sam was in every everyone that was in the work was in, was in the Oxford group. There's no AA program, so so Bill went to Frank and said that he wanted to give full time. He thought to just dealing with alcoholics, and this has always been in Bill's mind. I can I can see that now. It was always that concept. He always wanted to deal with the alcoholic. So Frank said, uh, Bill. He said, if that's the biggest thing you see for your life, go and do it. But he said, remember, we're dealing with alcoholic nations. <laughs> In quotation, that means uh, people, uh, nations, people drunk with power, sex, materialism, and, and every other thing. He said, that is our mission in life, to change, change things. So in, in 1938, uh, uh, Bill, of course, in the meantime, was in touch with, uh, with the Akron group. That's Dr. Bob. And uh, the other people involved there in the Oxford group. Now, I never met Doctor Bob. I, I I never, or his wife Anne. I never, I never met them. But I did meet several of the people involved. A fellow by the name of T. Henry Williams. Now, T. Henry Williams was a he was a mechanical engineer, and he developed the the machinery for retreading of automobile tires. And, and of course, in 1930, retreading tires was a big thing then. And, of course, uh, that put him in touch with fellows like Firestone and Cyberling and other tire, Henry Ford, and all that sort of, uh, that group of people. And uh, uh, so there was, there was uh, Bill and uh, Dr. Bob, they used to meet in T. Henry's house, and they met, they met, they met in... Henry, uh, Henrietta Cyberling's home. She had an apartment there, and uh, she was always holding meetings her, in her home. And uh, so uh, there was always a controversy, a controversy developed where AA started. Uh, Henrietta Cyberling said it started in her apartment when, <laughs> when, when Bill and Dr. Bob sat down to plan this thing. Uh, T. Henry Williams always maintained that it started in his living room where he, he'd point to a spot on the floor. He said, Bill Wilson got down on his knees, gave his life to God at that point. He said, that's where it started. That's when it started. <laughs> well, regardless of uh, when it, or where it started, it did start in Akron. And I, I don't think anyone can deny that uh, it started in, in Akron. And uh, so... Uh, 
I lost track of Bill then. I, I elected to stay with Bookman and his work with the Oxford group. And in 1938, about the same time that Bill and Dr. Bob started the AA program, Frank Bookman was in Germany uh, working with Hitler with the, with the Oxford group. And uh, you say, well, he, he didn't, he didn't make, make much headway, but he, was, uh, he made a lot of headway with, with uh, some lieutenants and some of uh, the uh, uh, support people of Hitler, which later uh, came into play and had a great effect on re reestablishing a relationship after the war between France and Germany. That's a whole other story, which, which I won't tell. But Bookman at that time was in, uh, walking in the Black Forest one day, and the thought came to him that the next great movement in the world would be the moral and spiritual rearming of men and nations. And he began to share this thought with people. And then the nomenclature changed from the Oxford group uh, to moral rearmament. Uh, he began to, everyone was thinking in terms of military armaments, arming, uh, 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 rearming, and all this. Uh, but it was always in a material sense. It was always in a military sense, a war sense. But Bookman was talking about a moral and spiritual rearming of people and nations. And that's what he began to talk about. And in 1939, the, the movement of moral rearmament was, was, was launched, and the work with the Ox Oxford group then became moral rearmament. And I elected to stay with, with that group because uh, uh, my problem wasn't, uh, I wasn't a compulsory drinker. I drank to have fun and, and have, be the life of the party and all this sort of thing. Uh, but uh, many people drink from fear. Uh, because they don't want to be antisocial or considered antisocial if they're offered a drink. And uh, often people drink from the problems that are, that are never solved in their, in, their, in their life. So these problems continue to drive the person back to drink. So it's a constant thing. Uh, so, but I, I like to stay with the book one, and uh, I've, I've continued to do that. I was on the National Board of Directors until recently. I became 90, and I thought that was time for me to quit, and I quit. <laughs> and no one got down on their knees and pleaded for me to stay on the board. Uh, so I thought the decision on that basis was, was, was good. So I lost track of Bill at, the, at that time, and uh, so because I was giving my, my full uh, support and everything to uh, the, the model rearmament. Uh, but I'd like to go back and talk a little bit about some of the other people involved in this personalities. One is Sam Schumacher. Sam Schumacher was, uh, he was, uh, I don't think he was the greatest life changer that I ever saw, but, uh, he was one of the, he was one of the best. Now, now you have to remember that the, 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 you say, what did the Oxford group have to offer you? What, what was it? If it wasn't, didn't talk about alcohol, what did they talk about? The Oxford group was basically a, uh, an evangelistic movement. That is, if, if it was, a, if, uh, we had a tremendous amount of people come from the, from the churches who had never found uh, an experience of Christ or God in their life. And this was not a, it was not a uh, hallelujah, praise the Lord type of thing. It was, uh, it was not a sanctimonious group. It was a very uh, practical, honest, laughable. We had a lot of fun at these meetings. People telling uh, the funny stories about themselves, of, of how, uh, what they had done and how God had brought something new into their life. But this was the atmosphere that you got. Uh, uh, Sam uh, was very direct. Uh, for instance, if uh, if you would go home from a meeting uh, like we have here, we're going to have here over the weekend, the first thing Sam would say to you, what did you see new for yourself you hadn't seen before? He was always looking for that next step uh, in a person's life. There was no. Uh, he always used to say that you're either 
There, there's no middle ground. You're either part of the disease or you're part of the cure. Uh, you, you have to, and you, you elect every day whether you're going to be part of the disease in, in the world or, or you're going to be, live, live the cure. And, and so Sam was always, always trying to get people to, um, uh, to see new steps for you. I remember he used to come to my, our home in Frederick and, uh, we were just raising a family then, and he would say to my wife, uh, I presume uh, you, you're changing people every day. Oh, yes, yeah, she said, some of them I change twice a day. And, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, he said, I don't mean a baby. She said, I don't mean he said, so, uh, he said, <laughs> so I remember uh, Sam had a home down in Baltimore, and uh, when he retired, he came there to live. So... Uh, I'm a member of the Methodist Church, so we asked Sam to come in and, as a guest speaker one day. So uh, he came in, and uh, Sam had a habit of, uh, when the sermon was over, he always went to the door, and, I, and some of you may have his book. His wife wrote a book, Helen wrote a book that, called He Stands at the Door. And this was Sam's technique. He always, he was his way of personalizing his sermon. He always he didn't say, how are you doing? It's a nice day. And he always said something very pertinent, very deep to these people. And when he was, he just finished his sermon there on that day, and he was out standing at the door, and one of our little old ladies went out, and she said, Dr. Schumacher, she said, I, I, I want to tell you how much I enjoyed your sermon today. He said, in a very gruff voice, said, you're not supposed to enjoy it. You're supposed to get out there and do something about it. Well, this poor old lady looked like someone had thrown a bucket of water on her. She, she certainly had never had a minister talk to, her, talk to her like that. But if you knew Sam, that was Sam. And I can visualize a lot of the, of the, uh, uh, the early uh, uh, give and take that went on in New York between Bill uh, and, and, and Sam. Uh, there was another fellow. Uh, we talked about life changes. Uh, it was a fellow by the name of Cleve Hicks. Uh, I guess Cleve, in Oxford group days, he was the greatest life changer that I've ever seen in my life. In those days, we had uh, in hotels. We uh, we had elevator boys running the elevators. You didn't you didn't have a push button type of thing then. And I've been on elevators that that we'd go and go to the fourth or fifth floor, and and this fellow Hicks was talking to the elevator boy about the deepest things in his life, and not in a sanctimonious way at all, but a very practical down the road. He knew just how to go into a fellow's life and what to say. So I I said to a friend of mine, I said, you know, this guy is a great life changer. Uh, but he's he's a nice jovial fellow. He has a good personality. And I said uh, he likes people. And I said uh, he's a natural life changer. But my friend said, yeah, but he wasn't like that always. He said I was his roommate in in prep school, and he said he was the most disliked guy on the campus. He said he was arrogant. He was he was selfish. He was self-centered. He said it was only when God came into his life. To the Oxford group, they they changed it, and tremendous change came. This guy they lived. He 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 was full time volunteer with with Bookman, no pay. He lived out of a suitcase. In those days, Bookman had a mobile force of between 150 and 200 young unmarried people, uh, mostly men. There were very few uh, women in the group then. Uh, in this mobile group. But that group was was so geared that at the drop of a hat he could move them into a trouble spot in the world tomorrow, and it was a very effective uh, way of doing it. He took this group into South Africa, and uh, not all of those. There were mostly Oxford group students that he was working with in 1928. He took them in South South Africa to deal with the same problems that they're dealing with down there now. Uh, these p- people went in there on quite a different basis. They went in simply telling their stories of how God had come into their life and changed them personally and what he had taken out and the purpose he had given for their life. And that was the reason they were coming. 
this is quite different. People were telling them quite different that the things they ought to be doing in order to straighten up their affairs. But here was a group coming, asking nothing, simply telling them how they themselves had changed. Well, this idea became so popular that people b began looking them up. And they were traveling in railroad cars. Well, the porter on the cars got tired of directing people to where these fellows were, so he wrote Oxford Group on the, on the doors of the car. And that's the way the name Oxford Group came into being. Before then, it was called the First Century Christian Fellowship. Oxford Group, 1928 till 1938, and then Marl rearmament from, from that on. So this fellow Hicks, Cleve Hicks, was a part of that mobile group. He could move, uh, of course he lived out of his suitcase and he could go anywhere uh, at a moment's notice. He, uh, he used to, uh, I had moved to Baltimore in the meantime, and he used to come down there to spend the weekends. And he was a great walker. He used to walk, but near the end, he he just wanted to sit in a chair. And forty-five years old, this guy was forty-five years. Old. He just wanted to rest. He died shortly after that heart attack because he just gave himself, and that's the way many of these people gave them themselves. We would have a meeting uh, like we're having here at tonight. Well, the meeting would only start when this was over. Because then you would sit down personally and talk to people about their life. And that is the way the change came about. You'd sit down, you'd take, you'd take that person through, uh, through, we had a regular life changing program called the five C's. You hear it referred to in some of the literature now. But the one was confidence, the next was confession, the, the next was uh, conviction, and then conversion, and then continuance. Uh, and the way that worked was that the... Uh, listen, am I taking too much time here? Wait, 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 wait. Uh, 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 the, the, the way this, this worked was that you... you uh, no one would listen to you if they don't know you have confidence in you or something. So there's no use talking to people about something until you gain their, until you gain their, their confidence. So... That's where confidence comes in. And the next is confession, where you share with the person what God has taken out of, out of your life. And the thing, the thing, and the, the things he's, he's, he's given you, the purpose, a new purpose, a new dynamic that he's given to you. Then the next one is conviction. That brings conviction in the life of another person. I'll tell you more about that tomorrow. And then the next one is conversion. That's where he became converted and the fifth one is continuance and that is the roughest one of all uh, I mean the, these aren't absolute I mean um, obsolete they're, they're still here today and that's what we ought to be uh, using with people we, we'll, we can talk with them more about that but continuum, continuance is the roughest one uh, because you don't take a new baby and put it out on the doorstep and expect it to live. No, you 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 keep it in the house. Uh, you put you put you keep it warm. You put you clothe it. You bathe it. You feed it. You give it love. You give it care, and and you help that that newborn physical baby to uh, to grow. And that's the same thing that happens or should happen in a spiritual life. It's when a person makes a decision. Uh, they're going to need they're going to need fellowship. They're going to need Bible study. They're going to need prayer. Uh, they're going to need love, care, devotion, and all that sort of thing that you as a person can give them. And that is a problem because many people don't want to go through this this deal. Now, uh, uh, I lost my train of thought here for, 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 for a moment. Uh, but... Uh, unless we can, unless we can do this, that person uh, sort of dies on the vine. Now, I'll tell you how this works practically. Uh, you take a fellow like uh, uh, Billy Graham the, or any of the evangelists. They go and they have a meeting. Hundreds of people come up there. Uh, they, they hear something inspired. They want to find something new. They want to make a new start in their life, and they come up uh, and and 
Billy Graham knows that possibly that's the last time he'll see those people because he can't stay in that town and continue that process of helping him to grow in it spiritually. So then where did they come from, these people? Most of them came from the local churches. Well, where did they go back to then? They go back to the local churches. Well, if they weren't finding something new in the churches then, uh, that they found it here, what are they going to, how are they going to, who's going to support this new decedent in their life as they go back? See, because other people don't know about this. So that's the reason the fifth C is, is, is so, is so very, very difficult. Uh, and, uh, uh, but, but those are the, uh, that is, that's what we were taught as a procedure. And uh, we used to have a saying that if you're not winning, you're sinning. Uh, and and uh, I think that could be interpreted too in, in our in our in our AA program. I'm just telling you how it was back then. Now you have to relate how it is now. You see the deal. Uh, but but my experience is is I'm going to. You see, I have access. I go to. Uh, maybe I'm uh, uh, more gift. Uh, I'm, I'm given I'm given better advantages, let's say, than, than you all might be. Because, see, I, in my capacity, what, what do you call me? Distinguished. Uh, say, yes. I have access to NAs. <laughs> I go to uh, GAs. <laughs> and I go to 12-step programs. And you won't believe what they're doing in some of these 12-step programs. Uh, I went to a 12-step program, you know, and uh, they asked me to come in as a speaker. So uh, they said that they have a, the way they start, they go around the room and say, what are you abstaining from? So when they come to me, I said, I'm abstaining from everything. <laughs> uh, and, <laughs> uh, so I have advantage, you see, of, 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 of seeing how the, all the others, uh, others operate here. Uh, and uh, <laughs> uh, so, uh, uh, let me see once. Uh, uh, I have to I have to think what I was what, what I was going to, what I was going to say to you here. Uh, put me on the track here. What was I talking about here? Was it? <laughs> making the transition to the uh, continuance. Uh, uh, in the uh, oh, oh yeah, yeah. Well, uh, well. So. Uh, uh, so the uh, the uh, 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 what, 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 I can hear very well. What, what you were what you were hearing in the twelve oh, seconds compared to the oxygen. Oh yeah, well, I, I might tell you that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, the, the, the one so I was amazed, you know, because coming out of the Oxford group, you know, this, this one woman said that she was abstaining from a bad temper, uh, and another one was overeating. And one of them was even abstaining from tight clothes. She had a tendency to wear tight clothes to attract people's attention. So she had a conviction that was wrong. And uh, <laughs> so they wanted to get away from that. So they were they were uh, abstaining from uh, from from uh, from everything. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, let me go back to the uh, uh, Sam Schumacher and the uh, and the fifth step. I was with Sam one at an Easter service one time in the National Cathedral in Washington. And we had a church meeting, and then we went into a, a parish hall meeting, informal meeting. A lot of people came in. A lot of ministers came in. So one of the ministers there said, uh, in an informal gathering, he said, Dr. Schumacher, he said, uh, why don't you insist that your converts, as he called them, go back into their churches? And Sam said, well, I wasn't conscious that we weren't sending them back in the churches. But he said, from a realistic standpoint, he said, you have to understand that sometimes it's like putting a live chicken under a dead hen. <laughs> and this minister said, yes, he said, uh, he said, uh, I, he said uh, I, I see what you mean. <laughs> Uh, you, you, you see, uh, uh, most people in churches, and I think it, it's uh, it's uh, I see it in the AA program too, is that uh, most people never get beyond the point, or never get beyond the experience of their own conversion. Now, uh, what I mean by that is that their conversion is good, it's meaningful, there's nothing wrong with the thing, but 
their conversion doesn't become multiplied into the life of another person. There's no evangelistic out outrage. Ninety percent of the people that I see in AA meetings in around my area are they go to keep sober only. They they there's no outreach. There's no personal outreach of of them into the life of of, of other people. Uh, uh, did I tell you about the uh, Sam, about the Bill and the uh, the converts he had when he first started when he went out? Oh, of the, Bill Bill worked with about fifty. Uh, alcoholics for about six months when he when he first went on his own with the AA movement, and at the end of six months there wasn't one of those people any different, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and and he was very discouraged. He was going to quit, but Lois said, "Look, Sam," he said, "you got to remember." I mean, uh, Bill, look, uh, Bill. He said, "You got to remember that not once during those six months did you yourself want to drink," and he said, "You're right." So responsibility for other people became the keynote and still is today of the AA movement. In the, my experience in the early AA movement is that these people were so fervent, they would go any time of the day or night, no matter if someone was in need, they would go and, and, and help that. But I don't see that happening now. I don't hear of it happening. Maybe it is, but I don't hear of this, this thing. But, uh, but uh, it, was that, it was that outreach for people, that was a carryover from from the 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 uh, the, the Oxford group. Now, uh, I, I've been in this thing since 1935, as I told you, and I see I see lots of changes, uh, both in the in Maori Armament program and in the AA program. In the Maori Armament program, when we switched from the Oxford group to Maori Armament. Uh, the emphasis then it was still an evangelistic movement, but basically we were we were we were dealing with uh, with the with the needs of people. That, that is, it became what they termed an ideology, uh, uh, where you were dealing with the, the, the people with the cause and effect, dealing with the people who caused a certain thing to bring about uh, another effect. Bookman's idea was always new men, new nations, a new world. He never varied from that. He used to say uh, that everyone wants to see the other fellow different, and every nation wants to see the other nation different. But everyone and every nation is waiting for the other fellow and the other nation to begin. That if you want an answer to world, in the world today, the best place to start is with yourself and with your own uh, nation. You see, we were, uh, uh, an example of this is that people talk about uh, changing the world, and they, when you think of changing the world, you think of what's happening in Bosnia or Timbuktu or, or someplace not around. But what is your world? Your world are the people that you contact. The people that you touch, that is your world. So if you're not being effective with the people in, the, uh, the, in that world that you live in, how are you going to, what are you going to do for the people in Bosnia around? around? So, so this thing is very thing. See, we used to have slogans like, uh, uh, crows are black the world over. Meaning that uh, we're not different. I mean, we're all, when we basically when you when you talk about it, we, uh, we never we never like to face it, but but we all, every one of us, we're all dirty people. It's a wonder that how God puts up with us, and this is this is the thing, yeah. Uh, and uh, so what the Oxford group was to, was to was to was to get people to recognize these things by throwing four standards out at them, and and that's the way. Uh, they, we used to, I remember we had a, a cartoon, a, a cartoon that it showed a fellow coming back from a fishing expedition. He had his fishing poles, but he didn't have any fish. And the, the caption underneath was said, I didn't get any fish, but I, I influenced a lot of them. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, uh, so you, uh, you, uh, so you, you know, often people settle uh, settle for influencing people. I, I, I influence a, a, a fellow. 
so uh, uh, let's see what were some of the uh, some of the other things we uh, uh, oh uh, oh one was that you can't keep the the birds from flying over your head, but you can keep them from building nests in your hair. And uh, that was that was one uh, that we used a lot. And uh, uh, the if Bookman brought uh, anything new to the Christian faith. And, and it's a, you know, there was a tremendous difference in those days. It was a, uh, it was a, quite a difference between the Oxford group people and, and so-called church people in, in, in those days. It's amazing. But all those people came out of the, of, of, of the, of the churches. It was a very aristocratic uh, movement. People asked me what it was like and all, all that sort of thing. And it was quite different than what we do. Well, it's not quite different, but, uh, we didn't have the formality, uh, not formality, the uniformity, I guess, that we have in the uh, in the A meetings today. Uh, you always start your meeting, you know, with certain certain things, and, and uh, uh, we didn't do that uh, in, in those days. We had a leader, and that person would would call on different people to witness to uh, what was happening in their life, what had God had taken out of their life, and uh, out of this then came. Uh, this is a, this came the conviction of, that w- which made it. The, you established the atmosphere in which the, the later mo- uh, meeting took place, where the individual sitting down talking to another person would take place, uh, and you, the fellow would be pretty much primed by by, by that, that time. And that's the way uh, the uh, uh, that's the way the movement uh, was carried on. It was a one-on-one basis, uh, and. Uh, uh, that's the way it went. Yeah. Uh, I was thinking. Uh, uh, also, the uh, uh, of, of the mecha- there were certain mechanics that went in. Bookman, oh, Bookman brought four things. Uh, what, I mean, really, two things to the Christian faith. He brought. The four standards, which they refer to in the big book and, and which we don't talk about enough now, and, uh, but the four standards. And I think these four standards should be the criteria by getting into your fourth step that you, you have. Because you talk about taking an inventory, a personal inventory. Well, what do you take a personal inventory on? Uh, uh, certainly, you're going to be not going to be too hard on yourself, and you're going to be as easy as you can. Uh, <laughs> uh, so... so uh, uh, so I think the four standards ought to be in there. Bookman brought four standards to, to us. These were biblical, taken from the sermon, Christ's Sermon on the Mount. Uh, and uh, the other thing he brought, that God had a plan for your life. And if you lift, listen to the deepest thing in your heart, you will know what that plan is based on those four standards. Another thing he was strong on is restitution. Very, very strong on restitution. Uh, uh, and, and I, uh, uh, I didn't, I, I didn't know too much about the restitution, and I, I, but I couldn't understand why he was so strong on it. But later on, I, 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 I found out uh, why he was uh, strong on it. Now, I always thought the restitution was something that you took, like sponging your own slate clean and uh, getting good, clean feeling inside. Yeah, it's that sure. But the big thing is what it does for the other person. The, the other person. I was telling someone here this evening, the simplest form of restitution I can think of is that every one of us in this room has had this experience. We've been at loggerheads with someone. And we've gone back to that person and said, look, uh, so-and-so, I, I'm sorry what I said to you the other day. I really didn't mean that. Invariably, this person will say... Uh, well, look, it wasn't all your fault. I had a part in it. So what has become, what has, was a barrier between you two now is a, is a, goes into a horizontal bridge. as a new relationship been established between you and that person. Something that was not there before. And you, all of you have experienced this. There's something new born between you and that other person. Something you can follow up on and go deeper and think. That is the simplest form of restitution I can I can think of. 
Now, Bookman was very strong on restitution going back and and giving uh, amends for something that that uh, that uh, uh, you had done wrong and uh, based on what has been revealed to you in quiet times basing your life on those four standards and, and that's all really Bookman's Bookman brought and he conducted meetings and and people uh, talked about the deepest things in their life and uh, sometimes in a very funny way because there was uh, there was these were funny stories we proceeded on the basis of the, so this was a life changing program bookman always said new men new nation and new world he said you can vote the democrats in, in and the republicans out and vice versa but unless you deal with the basic motives of men you're always going to end up with the same thing. And that's exactly what we have. Unless you deal with the things that, that, uh, that affect people's lives and change the, these things, let God change these things, you're always going to end up with the, with the, with the same story. Now, I'll tell you a lot of restitution stories tomorrow when I tell my own, own personal stories. And I have what to me was a classic because it, it really brought... Uh, brought me to my knees uh, in a big way uh, when I when I know what happened. Uh, but restitution was one of the things. So we're talking about four standards. We're talking about guidance of God, quiet times, and we're talking about about restitution. Now those are the, the things that stand out in uh, to me as the uh, other th people may have seen other things. But those, I think, were the essential things that Bookman brought in. These were the things that Bill, Sam Schumacher, Dr. Bob tried to convey into the four standards. I mean into the 12 steps. Now, if you go into the 12 steps, everything that I've said here is in there. If you draw them out, you see they're there. But uh, they, I think they, they need to be more uh, more legible, more tangible, more, more uh, something that they just jump out at you and, and this sort of thing. Because what I see happening is there's been a deterioration in the AA movement. There's been a deterioration in moral rearmament uh, 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 movement because I don't see people now in the moral rearmament moving, uh, sitting down with people as we did in the Oxford Good Days and, and on a personal change basis, t taking them through the, f the, 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 the four standards. They would take us to the four standards, just like you take people to the 12, 12 steps. Uh, and uh, I could never understand why the difference between the one step, the first step, and the second is that <clears throat> but you admit that you have a problem you can't solve, and yet <clears throat> that God has taken, God has given you an answer, yet you, you can't bring yourself to believe in God. I mean, in the early... Early day, I had that experience with a lot of people. They never got twelve. They never got past the second step, <coughs> and where you could take an actual group person and go through the twelve steps without any problem at all. But 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 I but what I'm afraid of now, and I've shared this with the with the hierarchy of the of the Maori Armament movement, is that people come into a meeting like this, and they go away. As a fisherman, they go away influenced, and the first thing you know, they they are on the fringes of the moral movement. They're 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 coming into meetings, and they're they're they're, uh, they're but they have never made that basic decision in their life, but they are consider themselves a part of the of the of the uh, of the uh, of the MRA uh, program, uh, and so the thing is that. Uh, if they never got took, taken to the steps, how are they going to generate something new in someone else's life on the same basis? You see, so it's uh, generation after generation that gets watered down. You see what I'm saying? And, and I think that that, that that could be happening in, in the AA movement too. We could be uh, we could be selling our heritage for a mess of porridge, as I as I like to put it. it, it is, is that we, we we're selling the thing cheap. You see, I program is not to get people into AA movement. Our program is to get God in charge of people's lives. That's what we want to do, you see. Uh, and so many times we try to get people in churches 
<laughs> or into a movement or something uh, with, without getting the principle of that movement or the thing is, in, into the motivating force of that person. And uh, so, uh, I don't know, Wally, I talked a lot. I have a habit of being, they said I have a habit of, uh, of uh, having a diarrhea of the mouth and a constipation of ideas. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so, but yeah, I don't know if anyone has any question uh, from. Uh, the, I'd be very happy to answer anything. I get it. Yeah. What are the fourth standard. The fourth standard. Oh, did oh, did I miss that? You, I, you know, uh, uh, fourth standard is is one is absolute honesty. The next one is absolute purity. The next one is absolute love, and the next one is absolute. Uh, Unselfishness. No, the selfishness is the third. I'm sorry. Love is the last. The, 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 those are the four. Now, when I met this group, I, uh, see, I didn't have any problem with, with honesty at all. That wasn't a problem. My problem was with the absolute part of honesty. You see, <laughs> and that's that's where that's where that's where I I, I, I hit the I hit the skids, you know, and. Uh, so the meeting just last week, a guy came up to me. We were talking about this. He said, "What is absolute purity?" <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's it. Uh, so that is a. That is a right. The next morning, in guidance, in my guidance, God said to me, "You let that fellow down. You didn't give him the real answer. You see, and I didn't. I didn't. I wasn't sharp enough with him, and I, I didn't get. It. I don't know what. I mean, I never have a chance. At, you see, often." God only gives us one chance with these people. Sometimes you don't get a second chance. And, and uh, so the thing is, uh, is to give the people the, your deepest message when you have the opportunity. Did you? Just last night, I sat in the Red Line Inn with a family from Connecticut. Two people, and they were sitting there. I went in and uh, sat down in the lobby waiting for dinner. And, and uh, so we got to talking, and he said, where are you going? I said, I'm going up to East Dorset to... Uh, to Bill Wilson's birthplace. And I said, do you, you know Bill Wilson? Uh, are you here, Bill? The fellow who started the A movie? Yeah, I said, I've heard of it and everything. So I said, well, let me tell you some some story about this. So I start with Bill Wilson, and the first thing you know, I'm into my personal story with, with him, you see. And, and, uh, and they were... Uh, they were absolutely fascinated with the stories and the thing I told them. So I guess I influenced them, I think, last night. <laughs> I didn't change anything think last night, I don't think. But, but no one made a decision with me, but I, I did influence them. Uh, the, 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 does that answer the question? Yes, I also now wonder if you do have a definition for absolute purity. <laughs> Well, uh, uh, definition for absolute purity. Uh, let me. Uh, I think Susan Wesley g- gave the best definition. I guess she was telling her. You see, it's another. Uh, I have mentioned a word that we never hear a lot about now is sin. You see, I never hear that, that word anymore. Sin. Uh, you see, it's made up of three S I N. Now, if you take that letter I, the big I out of that, you don't have a letter anymore. You don't have a word anymore. See, so we can relate to that. Yeah, yeah. How to, how to take that I out of thing? So uh, Susan said to John, I, "I don't. I mean, this is not uh, verbatim, but uh, she, she said this. She, she was giving a definition of sin, which is the opposite, the opposite, uh, the opposite of uh, absolute purity." Uh, she said that. Uh, uh, she said, uh, "Whatever." Whatever takes off your the your 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 uh, relish for spiritual things, or uh, let's see, what's it, I think she said the goodness of your heart. But she said, in short, whatever gives you, uh, whenever your body takes authority over your mind, that thing to you is sin, no matter how innocent it may seem in itself in the end. Uh, you see, uh, sin, uh, absolute purity may be, uh, I don't know, the, the first thing people think about when they do that, you, 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 we always think about sex, you see. 
Well, absolute purity means different for a single person uh, than it does for 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 a married person. Uh, now, uh, the Bible is very clear on that. You, you, there's you, the single person is absence, and which is, is very difficult for people right now with with all of the. Uh, the mechanical means of protection and all, and all, and all this thing, but 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 uh, uh, purity goes much beyond that. It's your, it's the things you think, and say and do. Uh, and uh, uh, I told this fellow, so I said, if you uh, uh, if you could uh, could you share these things with your mother. And I was trying to bring something practical in, in, into his life, but I know that uh, that uh, that uh, that this was his problem. This is this is the place where uh, God comes into your life, and often it is impossible to abstain from uh, acts of impurity. And and uh, but God, Christ can give you the power for that. And if you go deeper in the thing, He He uh, He gives us this power. It's uh, it's 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 more than that. It's a it's a purity of our of our thinking, of our relationship, uh, our hates and our greeds, and, and uh, uh, there are many many things involved in 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 absolute purity. And it's hard to give a definite a definite uh, uh, criteria for it. But this is where guidance comes. This is where quiet times comes in. This is a relationship with God comes in. Now, uh, all through the Bible, there are story, uh, there are example after example of all the scriptures refer to God speaking to people, God talking to people, uh, and uh, this 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 discourse that you're going to see is going to be very helpful tomorrow because. Uh, Bishop Sheen said, "said it's ridiculous to ring God's doorbell in prayer and then run away." Uh, uh, Buckley used to say, "You should write the thoughts down that come." He used to say that the uh, strongest memory is weaker than the palest ink, and uh, it's just a practical reason for writing the thoughts down so that you, your mind is ready for the next one, and also you can check these off at the end of the day to see if you followed all the thoughts. Uh, but the big thing is to have a sharing partner where you share these thoughts with. I think you call them sponsors, don't you, Nicky? And, uh, and uh, where, where you can, uh, 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 because uh, these are important things that you interpret these things right in your life, and and uh, and uh, 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 guidance says I think one of the one of the, one of the most important uh, things uh, in the Christian life. Uh, uh, you see, so many people, to me, think that God, our life is like a chessboard, and we pray for something. And God said, okay, uh, you've been a good fellow, I'll, I'll do that. So he moves that chess people, person around and moves that, uh, that uh, piece, they call it a piece into a position that, that, that uh, God doesn't operate like that. God operates through our lives. He uses our lives to touch other people. We're the instruments he uses. We say, make us an instrument of yours. Well, uh, uh, I, I don't think we know what we're talking about when we say that. Because it, we, he's trying to make us instruments, and he wants to talk to us. He wants uh, uh, Henry, uh, Henry Drummond. It was a great theologian. He died in uh, 1891, I think. A very concise person. He wrote a number of essays or sermons, and, and he talks about God's plan for our life in there. And he, that's way back in the 1800s. He was talking about about this. He was just. He said, just think that that, that God. The importance of this. He said, God has a plan for your life. It isn't for anyone else. Your life and yours only, and that you, that God can talk to you, and He doesn't. His His whispers are not for anyone else, but just for you, and the things that He wants you to do, the things He has for you to do, and the only way you're going to know that is listen for this. And it's, to me, it's a very practical uh, way. Uh, I, I, when I he talked to me about listening. 
first I said I thought they were crazy. Uh, I didn't uh, I didn't know how God could 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 uh, 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 could uh, talk to me. But I uh, so they had what they called a quiet time, and uh, so they had a movie. They were going to show at this mo- this uh, meeting where I was too, and they couldn't get the movie to, to get started. So he said, "Well, we're going to have a, we're going to have the meeting, and then we'll go back and have a quiet time." And so we had the meeting, and then we had the quiet time. And this fellow who was running the movie, he said, "There's the quiet time." He said, "I just had guidance." He said, "What was wrong with the movie?" And he went over and pressed the button, and it went right off. And I said, "Oh man!" <laughs> so it was at the same meeting. I had my first quiet time, and. Uh, Something had happened eight years before that. I had worked for a company, and they'd borrowed a company, a car from another company, and I was running that car. I, I went down to the University of Maryland one Saturday afternoon to a football game, got drunk on the way down, hit another car, didn't stop, came back, and I, I, I fixed my car up and lied out of it. I got the fellow who ran the garage to say I'd never had the car out, and the thing was smoothed over. I never would have thought of that humanly. I'll guarantee you, I never would have thought of that. That was the first thing that came into my mind, was to go back and restore for that car, a restitution. And uh, so some things you can't restore for, but there are many things that we can. And when that restitution is the thing that opens the door for, for other... So I went back and, and straightened up for that. But... Uh, that didn't change a whole lot of lives, but the thing it did change my life, I'll guarantee you, because it made a Christian quotation out of me as far as guidance was concerned. Because then I realized that there was something to this guidance, and that uh, God could speak to you if you would let Him. And uh, uh, all the Bible's full of references to God speaking to people and listening, God listening. But uh, I don't know; it never, it never came into into being until Bookman made it a made it a policy, and this is he said we ought to be listening. You know there was a there was I used to be a cartoon we had it had a person with big ears said so you have you have two ears and one mouth so you ought to listen twice as much as you talk. So I'm going to do that. <laughs> okay, is that it? All right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.